Benedict Cumberbatch. Yes, Claire Foy. Um, when did you first have the kernel of an idea to be an actor? Well, Claire Foy, um... <laughs> <laughs> that can't happen all the way through. Ask, I know. I know. Funny you should ask that question. We were told to mention everyone's full names when we. Yeah, so that's I just, true. just in case people don't know who we are, <laughs> it's a good start. Um, I, the kernel of the idea. That's a tricky one because I kind I grew up with it. Mum and dad are both actors, and I'd sort of you know a bit, a bit of you know born aside the trunk. I'd been on tour with them. I'd seen them. I'd been snuck around backstage. I'd been on sets. I'd, I'd had a sort of understanding of what it was they did for a living very early on. I, didn't, I don't remember there being a thing of, oh, I have to do this, although my godmother says there was a moment I stood on the stage at the RSC where she was working, we went to visit her, and literally held a spear and went, I want to do this, <laughs> into, into the darkened door that auditorium. Was the she was like, holy crap, he's only about, whatever, six mm. or something. I just swore, is, is it right to say crap? <laughs> okay, it's okay, we can say that. They said on The Simpsons, so. Yeah, exactly, so it's all right. On The Simpsons, it's okay. Yeah. But did you, your mum and dad did kind of, Repertory theatre, English yes. kind of. They, they, so mum, mum's uh, Wanda Ventham, and she was, uh, she is, she's much loved, and was a big star in the sort of sixties, seventies. Did lots of cult classics like UFO, The Saint, The Prisoner, wow. um, and sort of standalone dramas like Fallen Hero and Breakdown, and all sorts of things that won her accolades. She started in the theatre. She was going to be part of Peter Brook's band. Really? And she was pregnant with my sister from, her, who's my half sister, but my sister from. Yeah. Um, uh, mum's first marriage and she then she couldn't do the tour she couldn't commit to the RSC because of uh, because of tracks coming into the world that's her name or our nickname for her mm. and so she started to do more television and, and film work and just sort of took off dad much more theatre he started out I mean he did a huge stint to the RSC uh, no sorry not the RSC the Royal Court that's really where he I earned his that. That's really weird. Yeah, he was there with George Devine, I mean, right at the birth of kind of kitchen sink drama and um, the working class act. And he was the token posho. He was the guy whose petrol tank would be pissed in by Dennis Waterman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. be a nice position to be repeatedly in. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he, so he did some extraordinary work. He was in some of John Arden's original pieces, like um, Sergeant Musgrave's Dance and Patriot for Me, John Osborne's Patriot for Me. Wow. Yeah, very, very cool stuff. And, and then some TV work as well. So by the time I came along, you know, mum's definitely the better known of the two. Mm. Um, but dad was working nonstop, partly to pay for an education to basically pull me into line with the idea that it was madness to be, Don't you know, yeah, you know, peripatetic, not being able to plan your family holidays, not knowing where the next, you know, income's going to come from, all the uncertainty which was on display in their lives, our lives. And yet they managed to dial in particular squirrel away enough for a ludicrously expensive education mm. but you know he started that one the minute I was born yeah. and that was purely to make me see sense and become a doctor a lawyer a teacher just something of use to society <laughs> <laughs> that went well yeah I know you know <laughs> continually disappointing him by continuing to be an actor <laughs> a really 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 good one though oh, so that but that's good isn't it though well it's one of the reasons I do it, I guess, and one of the mo key motivations is to keep them happy and proud. It really is. And, um, and my dad said such a huge thing. It makes me sort of well up every time I think about it. We, uh, you know, after a while of going, are you sure? Are you sure? He then saw me at university and I was playing Salieri in Amadeus, which is, you know, it's a wonderful part. And he went, um, I was in the car park afterwards, and he said, you're, you're better at this than I ever was or ever will be. I can't wait to watch you and support you on what I think is going to be a fantastic career. Oh, I'm going. Oh. Um, so yeah, that was amazing. He's amazing. Um, but did you know that. when they, when you were growing up that what they did for a living? That's what I don't understand. Having a child, I don't quite understand how you explain to a child what you do. What you do because um, it's storyteller. I think yeah. storyteller. I think I knew. I, I I didn't quite get it. I remember one at one time being in the audience of um, a musical about Dr. Bernardo. And it wasn't great, great story, it but it, like it, wasn't, it wasn't the greatest show, as Dad admits himself. And he was so sick of it that he, I, I waved during one of the big songs, and he waved back. He just completely oh. broke the fourth wall. And he was much, <laughs> much more excited about it. So I think at that point, I was like, is Dad in something, or is he just Dad still, you know? Mm. But then I, you know, then I did get it, and um, I sort of loved it. I remember being backstage when Mum went on once in a Ray Cooney farce, and behind stage, you know, it's like behind this, there's just a few... Mm you know, triangular things and some stage weights and mm. people going and something a bit like <laughs> downstage left flat <laughs> <wing>. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like, darling, did you, um, did you eat that thing last night? Cause my, and you're on. And suddenly the minute that door opens and the lights and the sort of heat yeah. of it all, 
there's this instant transformation. I just remember my mum just kind of like, boop, just becoming something else before going on. I went, that looks amazing. That looks mm. crazy fun. And so that's kind of, yeah. So all over the place as far as a moment, I guess, because I grew up with it, it was a, it was a slow burn. Mm -hmm. How about you, Claire Foy? <laughs> when did you first get the can love an idea? Uh, I don't think I ever did. I think I sort of live in denial about the fact that I have in some way ended up actively choosing to do this with my life. Really? Yeah, because I don't think I ever, I think as a child, I think I wanted to be really good at something. Yeah. I think everybody does when they grow up. They want. Well, you are. I can back <laughs> no. right now, which is going to make it hard to, uh, for you to answer your question. But you are quite the most extraordinary <laughs> actress. I mean, you are deaf beyond belief. You can do any scale of performance. Oh, God. You just you are mesmeric to watch on screen. And I know what a joy you are because you're a friend to work with as well. You're kind of you're the full package. You're the real deal. And it's just it's it's magnificent that the world on the stage of the Crown has got to see it on mass. And you're just this is just the beginning. It's so exciting. God. But you get so, no, no, but I think you get so used to kind of, I don't know, um, I don't know. I really genuinely don't know. I think I wanted to, I wanted to be good at something right. and I don't think academically I kind of, I went to a grammar school, um, which I was really lucky to go to. But, you know, when you're with lots of people who are incredibly gifted, because that's what the premise what were you, of the But how did you get in? Was it your acting? Which did you, was that? No. So I failed my 12 plus. Right. Um, and I got in because my mum had to go to Aylesbury City Council and kind of give them, like, a portfolio of the reason why I could possibly get in. And you have to appeal. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, what really worked in my favour was the fact that my brother and sister had both got in on their own merit okay. and my parents had got divorced. So I think okay. she was, my mum went, she's actually very clever. Um, it's the fact we got divorced six years ago. Um, <laughs> that, but, but I'm so glad that she did fight for me to go to that school because I don't think if I hadn't have been surrounded by people who were really gifted in lots of other ways like maths and science and English and I sort of was looking at them going, I'm not good at any of these things really. I'm not, I'm, you know, I, can, I can work really hard. Yeah. And my sister is the same. Like yeah. We both are aware that in order to be good at something, it's, you have to work really hard at it. But yeah. I would sort of work really hard at it and then just be like, but it's still not happening. Like, I'm still not going, oh, if I you know, um, paint that picture somehow, it's amazing. Or if I write that essay somehow, I'm someone saying to me that I'm really good at it. So it, it took me a really long time. And my sister... Were you good at it when you first started? I mean, no. Well, no, I was at school. Not just being English prohibits you from saying you're good at anything. Did you? I mean, did you? No, did you, no not particularly. It wasn't like, oh, she's. That's, no, no, got no. A, that never know, happened at school. It happened at university. Right. But it didn't happen at school because at school, um, I, you know, I played um, various men in various <laughs> plays. <laughs> High five! I played various girls. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there's a niche there for it's us. It's a good training. It's mm. a good training. Keeps you on yeah. your toes. I did win, I mean, this is, this is now a ridiculous thing to say, but I won Best Actress in the school play because I played a man with post-traumatic stress disorder in the war, in, in the First World War. Oh, was it, was it um, R.C. Shows, um No, it was written it by one of the other pupils. Journey's End. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I remember walking Which around. You were at a gifted school. This is amazing. <laughs> but I was walk, like, walking around like my form room right. going I am David I am David because I thought that's what actors did like just sort of walk I was so nervous I was so I think nervous some actors do do that I think I am know. David yeah. <laughs> still now yeah god really weird I only just remembered that really it's kind of like the Meisner thing isn't it just yeah. repeating a truth or repeating a line so that something something suddenly becomes so automatic you don't question it yeah I think that's quite a bold thing to do Oh, God. I, mean, it was <laughs> I would love to have been a fly on the wall, but at the same time, I think that's, <laughs> whatever gets you there, you've got the prize, Claire. You oh, must have done God. something, right? And then what, so after school, wh where did you go to university? I didn't even Liverpool, know. Liverpool, John Moores. Oh, cool. Okay. And was that performing arts or was you, were you studying something else and then doing a lot of plays? No, well, no, because what happened was I, I was, wasn't brave enough to do the audition to do drama. Right. I didn't want to audition. So I did okay. drama and screen studies because I thought I'll make films. Okay. Because I, I, I love, I've always loved them. And so I thought that's what I'd do. And then I did sort of two years of making loads of films, finding it really boring in the editing room um, and just not having any ideas. Right. Like we'd once did a, like an entire film about a CCTV camera. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it really was nothing. <laughs> about the camera, not what it was saying. Just it was the about, camera, but it was like the life of a CCTV camera. I mean, <laughs> so obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, and then in my final year, I just sort of really, I sort of came to the understanding that I could do it and not really care 
I'd do it for me, like not really care if anyone was going to watch it. Right. And so I did, and then one of my um, one of the lecturers sort of said, "What are you going to do when you finish?" And I was like, "I don't know." He was like, "Have you thought about going to drama school?" And I was like, "Oh, I sort of been waiting for someone to say I could yeah. legitimately do that because I didn't know anyone who did anything like that." I've had three prime ministers, all of them ambitious men, clever men, brilliant men. Not one has lasted the course. Can I follow you? Yes. Did the crown choose you or did you choose the crown or was it a bit of both? That's a, that's a sign for that's it. yours. Yeah, or... <laughs> yeah, like, oh, oh. Um, it was... It was... Both, I think. Yeah. Um, I was. Do you know? Do you know about it before you were you were called up for an audition or no. A chat or an offer? No. No, 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 no. I think they'd done like a re they'd done a reading right. of it to sort of try it out, which it's I just script stage rather than people in it. Just like yeah, yeah. For Peter um, and yeah, and Peter Morgan, sorry. Peter Morgan, Morgan the creator of The Crown. Sorry. Um, and I, but I didn't. Um, no, I was five months pregnant, and I'd been working. I'd just done Wolf Hall. Wow. And so I had done Wolf Hall and gone, OK, I can have a baby now. Like, it wasn't like I didn't actually think now I'm going to have a baby, but I just sort of went... Um, <laughs> this would be an all right time to do that. I'm done. Yeah. I was like, I'm done. I've, I've, I felt like I was like, that was like a dream job for me, Wolf Hall. Amazing. And so I just um, was like, if this is the end of my career, then I'm happy. So I, you know, um, was really happy to be pregnant and just loved not working and loved the idea of, like... Y eons of time ahead of me where I'd be bringing up my child oh. and then <laughs> you get um, the invitation to go and meet Stephen Daldry who I just think is extraordinary and so then I went in with that sort of impression of going one I mean this is ridiculous I'm in a room with these people but yeah. two in what world they're going to give a pregnant woman the role of the Queen of England I just were you five months did you? five months yeah so my nose had started to spread and I was like quite sweaty a lot of the time. <laughs> and also just because it's one of those jobs where I just, yeah. I don't know whether you do this, but I definitely do it where I, I think in my head, I know all the incredible people that I know. Oh, always, always. Yeah. Do you feel a sense of guilt about like, are you sure you've got this right? I mean, there's literally five people I know who would cut off their right hand to do it, mm. you know, and who would be much better in my opinion. All, all the time, all the time. And it's mm. like, you just you know how lucky you are when it works out for you mm. and that's that's another key motivator for me it's just to sort of prove people's trust or faith or whatever you want to call it in me or idiot idiot trust or faith mm. and just go okay right well they've made this choice I've really really got to um, fulfill I guess but it was different wasn't it with, um, with Patrick Mel Melrose Patrick because Mel you were at the very 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 beginning of it weren't you Benedict could you please inform us of what I was kind of funny I was um, <laughs> I was I was at the beginning of it because I mean the books have been out for a while so the first one was written it's a it's an adaptation as you know of five novels and the first was written in 2001 I think the last in 2011 maybe even later and so I'd read these books come to them quite late by word of mouth and just immediately was like, this is extraordinary material. Mm. I mean, it's some of the most beautiful, stunning prose of the 21st century in the vein of even in War and, and Woodhouse, it's got that incredible ease about it and wit and it contains multitudes in a line, you get the whole picture of a character in a page, a world, and in a book, the entire story, and it just holds you. There are amazing, I mean, unbelievably, funny moments, laugh out loud moments, but also this, this trauma at the centre of it, this man who's um, you know, abused by his father from the age of five onwards, and then you jump forward to the next decade. Each book's about a decade forward, and it's him as a full-blown drug addict, which is actually our first episode. Um, going to pick up his dad's ashes, then he's sober without purpose, and I don't want to give too much, you haven't seen them all yet, have you? So, uh, uh, no, no, okay. But I mean, that was, they were there as pieces of fiction, and I although thinly disguised alter ego for the author. So I read them and I was doing a Reddit question. Mm. You know, the, the online. Yeah. So I said, they said, as I'm often asked, what do you want to do next? I don't have bucket list. I'm really, really lazy about yeah, that in a way, you know, that. terrible. And I've just been really lucky to kind of go from vine to vine mm. in answer to how you choose your jobs as much as I do. So much of it is just well, what's, in, what's in front of me, mm. you know. Um, and. That was the moment I said, well, you know what, I, do, I really want to play Hamlet because I'd sort of flirted with it at school, but not done that one. levels. Yeah, and so that came about. And then I said, yeah, and I really want to play Patrick Melrose. And they were like, okay. And I went, well, I want to play Patrick Melrose. And I explained what it was about. And 
I think that day Michael Jackson heard it bounce around the Twitter sphere or something, who's mm -hmm. with Rachel Horowitz, his wife, the producing partners that owned the books, the copyright mm -hmm. and um, property. They rang John, my agent in England, and I met with him like a week later, having That's sped read, amazing. like reread the book. It was incredibly fast. It was kind of like, oh God, what else? What else? Could I watch for? That? I like Maybe to I do. Have done that more often. I know. I would like to play Banana Man uh, in a filmic remake of said. Uh, Banana Man. Wouldn't that be great? Oh my God! It would. A case, a case you're having you. I, <laughs> exactly. That'd be great. They should do that, and I think you know they should also do Supergram. We need an. It's <laughs> great. There's a female here for superheroes. But we also need a, a, a female superhero of an age. Yeah. So Supergram should be brought back. Amazing. Or just uh, just a super grand. She's not pitching for super grand, but you know maybe. I know. Hey, I, I've got it in me. She's versatile. <laughs> um, I um, I, so I, I it, yeah, it came about like that, and then mm -hmm. and then very late in the day, I produced on it as well with Adam Acton, my produ pro Amazing. production company head. Yeah, it was Sunny. What was that was like? Wonderful, because you're creatively kind of fostering this thing, which, like I said, partly because it's an alter ego to the author, and I'd formed a relationship by then before coming on as a producer with Teddy St Alban, the writer. I wanted to care for him, for the cipher of reality that he'd made into a fictional character, much loved by those who've read it into our screen translation of it. So it was out of a duty of care, but also creatively. It's just wonderful you're involved in um, forming the production team, heads of department. Um, you, don't, you have an opinion about casting, but I was very wary of that. Amazing it's, cast, though. It's an incredible cast. And Nina, she's, she's brilliant. Was it Nina? Nina? Nina Gold. Nina Gold. <laughs> That's all we second have to names say. Have to say. Like, <laughs> what other Nina could be in the casting world? But Nina, Nina Gold, Gold is pretty much responsible for everything She's being well, good she ever. She did she the crown. Was, yeah, she did She's it. still doing the crown. I mean, she will forever be doing the crown. I know. But I think that's an incredible thing for her as a casting director because yeah. she gets to do like 250 characters. I mean... Uh, like per series. Per series, it's incredible. And it's gonna, she's going to be keep, she's going to go through absolutely every single English actor there is. I hope so. I it, at some point. At some point, I know, yeah. <laughs> you will be on there. I know. <laughs> um, but I think you know that thing of being there at the front door is it's a wonderful experience. It's my first feeling of that inception and completion mm. thing, which I kind of I kind of wanted that as a director at some point, Ooh. but I'm terrified of that. So I'd probably start incredibly small. But um, you said it now; it's going to happen. I would like to be a director. <laughs> Let's see, let's see what happens. Is hey, that what you uh, like to do? Jim Cameron here. I don't really <laughs> want to do Avatar 2. Do you want to do it? Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. got a movie I want you to take over. That would freak me out. That would, but that would, would you like to do that? You'd like to start to direct? I would love ultimately. to. I would really love to. And I, I don't think something I'm in, I'd really like to just have the experience of being behind the camera. But it, it, in all honesty, a bit like going back to the theatre because of family wanting to be more present dad I'd, I'd much that's so involving i mean ed berger who directed melrose has directed all five of them and it's just he's not stopped working for like a year and a half mm. you know, he's still in the edit for five and it's just on and on and on it has got an incredible kind of um i love watching things like that that have a um something that's incredibly unique about them but you don't know why it is unique yeah. i feel like it's you and him together is an in, is a combination. I can just sort of see it. I can see you as knowing you as an actor and having worked with you. I can see that you put so much of yourself into the role, and that so much of it was about you being free. Like I saw you make choices and do things yeah. that would I could just see that you were just go, in your head were going, oh I'll do that now. Oh that's exciting. And, yeah. and especially yeah. there's this one incredible scene in it, <laughs> which I, I'm going to watch on repeat, <laughs> where you take um, I mean about 400 different types of drugs. But when they're yeah. all, they all have their own different personality yeah, in your yeah, yeah. in your body. So yeah. one drug is telling you to do one thing, and and I, that you, I, it's just the most exquisite thing I've ever seen. Oh, thank but you. All, but see, also just watching you just fly, and it takes a very strong director as well to allow you as an actor to it's do true. that. It's true, and it's it's uh, he is that he he facilitates that, and he's a great first audience. But he's also just like, you know, you, I think we, you can definitely go further and and risk failing as well. Just being able to risk screwing it up and not mm. have that thing of like, uh, you know, time pressures or everything else that kind of crowds in on creativity with filmmaking uh, out of the necessity of, you know, getting the day done and, and money, mm. um, of just being free to fail and, and fail better, which is all we can ever really do. It's all imperfectible, isn't it? So, mm. Do you feel like you're getting better at that the more you do it? A little bit, yeah, a little bit looser, a little bit looser. And with this as well, I, you know, with that particular scene as well in the hotel where he's just, all these voices are coming out of him, that kind of schizoid episode, there's, that I was rewriting it. I was rewriting it the day before and pulling things in from the book. David Nichols didn't know how to give, and he, and he says this, I'm not criticizing him, yeah. he's, he's the adapt, he's wonderful, David Nichols, an amazing, amazing writer in his own amazing right. Amazing writer. Amazing writer. And he, 
has done an extraordinary job. There was so much metaphor and imagery in the book, and to translate that, you know, you want dialogue and action as a writer. So he's done yeah. the most amazing job of containing that. And Ed, with the wonders of cinema and, and, and filming, has, has created space for metaphor within subtext and looks mm. and everything. Care for it? How do you care for a dessert? I'll have a creme brulee and a Marc de Bourgogne. But it's still not heroin, is it? Heroin's the cavalry, the missing chair leg. Heroin is love. Simply call 555-1726. Claire Foy, mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the exquisite craft on display from you in The Crown. I mean, it is just, it's groundbreaking. It's, it's inspirational. It's I think groundbreaking. That I, well, I, no, I disagree. You know, you've created something quite unique out of a character that's very, very difficult to crack with. You've created a huge amount of empathy, enigma, um, vulnerability, humor, and with so little. I mean, it is a masterclass in restraint, but my God, it's all going on. And your, your physicality, the way you hold yourself, the tension in your hands, the shift of the skirt in the seat, uh, the power play, but also being completely cut off at the knees, whether it's by Philip's behavior or, or a courtier or an unexpected challenge, it's, it's a real marvel. And I thought it really geared up in this series. Even I, how could it have been better? But it was. It was extraordinary. And mm. I'm really interested to know with you how with Stephen and Philip and Ben and who am I forgetting? Philippa Lothorpe. Philippa yeah. Lothorpe. Oh, my mm -hmm. God, that, that episode was mm. spectacularly good. She's extraordinary. She was amazing, amazing director. Um, how they give you your freedom. How much it's based on what the success has been before, how much you got more room or less room or the same room to explore. Did it feel different doing the second series? Um, it's about five questions. I, <laughs> it's about five questions. I don't know, it felt, um, I think there was, I know this, there was sort of a, by that point we all knew what we were doing. Yeah. Um, in the sense that the kind of, any sort of um, ambiguity there was about how you would be with a prime minister or anything like that, it all formed its own rhythm really so you sort of knew how her approach would be to certain things but the thing about peter morgan who's the writer of it is that he watches you knows you're getting comfortable and so then gives you a scene which is incredibly difficult really? where yeah yeah so he will give you then a scene where it's an incredibly emotional scene and he knows that the choices you have are restricted and he wants to see you struggle with that that's what he writes as the writer for the actor and for the character. So I was constantly Was that going on in the first series or was that very much more markedly there in the second, do you think? Um, it, was going on in the, it was going on in the first series, um, but I think the second series was very personal. Yeah. It was very, I, for me anyway, it felt very much about their marriage. Absolutely. Um, and her world was so small. She became so kind of cut off yeah. um, and there was less direction she could go in. Um, and so I felt it was, it was quite, uh, relentless in the in the in the culmination I felt of of her emotionally come, becoming like unraveling really yeah. but having nowhere to go yeah. um, it was a real pressure cooker to watch as yeah well. it's but such it's relief at the end that that compact that love yeah. returning that understanding of what's gone on has gone on but the love is still yeah. there which I just thought it was heartbreaking yeah but so they I must but the directors they really of the show they really really we were all all over the show because it was it was filmed out of sequence, out of um, location, so all the time. I had all five, which is a mammoth task yeah. with Melrose, but at the same time, Edward Berger, sorry, the director. I, but my God, in a way, he could keep sewing all of the narrative together. How did that work when you were crossing episodes and times and different directors? It was tricky. But that was also tricky because, you know, for us, the show had been so successful. Yeah. But there were so many things that we then had to do around that, yeah. um, which we never would have changed. But it just meant, added another element for production who were going, please, can we make the programme? And, you know, yeah. we had to go off and do different things. But, um, but they, the directors, all, they have such a passion for their episodes. Yeah. And, so, and they all work together. And there's a real sense of camaraderie and... Um, the show as a whole as opposed to a director coming in and going this is my episode and I'm gonna make it completely different. There's a real respect which um, gave it a unified feel yeah, it always does. But yeah and, and also we had you know um, incredible DOP Adriana Goldman um, who all the way through yeah um, and and um, Stuart um, who was uh, with him as well so it was kind of like it had a kind of unity and a thing otherwise but we all would like I love the differences in styles like and I remember Philippa um, mm. uh, his episode mm. that, like pfft, Really, suddenly I was like, "This is this is definitely a, diff a different shift mm -hmm. in focus, yeah. both camera-wise and, and storytelling-wise." Yeah. She's just won a BAFTA for it. No, she won a BAFTA for three girls. We all closed our eyes. 
our ears to what was being said about you. But when the truth finally came out, there is no possibility of my forgiving you. The question is, how on earth can you forgive yourself? Benedict, yeah. I already sort of know this. Yeah. Because um, I know you. Um, but I know that you're not on social media. Nope. Nope. Neither am I. <laughs> um, but I do know that you have played Sherlock Holmes, for example, yes. and that when you play a character like that, people feel like they have a certain amount of ownership and love of you, which obviously is amazing, yeah. but therefore it comes with it kind of um, a price where you're sort of always on display. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you do about that? <laughs> Not much. Um, <laughs> Just you carry know, on. Well, it's true. I kind of do. I mean, you know, in environments where it's about being on display like this or, you know, doing a Reddit or a, or a mm. Twitter thing um, through someone else's hashtag or whatever they call it, because I don't do any of that myself. Mm. I'll, I'll I'll play the game and have fun with it for five seconds and then shut the door and run because, mm. um, you know, fame is that you, as you must now know as well. I'll, I'll ask mm. the question of you as well. It's um, it does require you in this weird way to sort of become your own narrative. You have this preconceived idea of who you are that's out there, this separate narrative to the truth of who you are, and that can be even after a, a detailed profile interview. And you think, oh, that's going to be a fair reflection due to the conversation we had. Ooh, 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 because you know, mm. our desks and papers uh, need to create a sort of exclusive, so it gets farmed out as a news story with a quote out of context, and that's all very tiresome. And mm. I have to say, just being recognised is okay. There are days when I just would rather, like anyone, be under a duvet pretending I don't exist, um, let alone famous for whatever I do. And other days when I'm fine to hold my head up high and go, thank you. But most, most of what you meet in, in the flesh is benign. It's people just liking what you do. Yeah, which is lovely. Yeah. But the demand on your time is something that you, I have to navigate. And I think it's always easy if you do have a purpose when you're in public, like you're going from A to B or you're with people that you're helping, whether it's children mm. or, or friends and family. So, um, but I love also giving back and being you know, very warmed and, and grateful by the, the sort of following I have. And, mm and realising that that's part of the reason I'm able to do the projects I want to do. And it's because there's an audience that's keen to see my work. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. And in the right context, happy to um, acknowledge it and thank people and shake them by the hands and take a photograph. But I, it, the selfie thing is a bit weird. I, I do still feel like, mm. do, can we not just have a moment? Can we not just hello? I know, I, I know, I know. So, selfie with, you know, I don't know, Paul McCartney, I want to talk to him. I know. I want to talk to him about chord structures and albums <laughs> and tours and life now, you know what I mean? I yeah, I know. Dig, dig a bit deeper, but um, it, it has just become the modern handshake. And I really realised it in Wales once I stepped out of the, the you know, the makeup truck or something on Sherlock, and all these kids had sort of formed and heard that we were there. And instead of going, whoa, waving or anything, they just went, it was like a salute of phones. It was like I some know. sort of totalitarian state, like showing an ID card or something. but. And then just looking, you know, enchanted by whatever I was doing on their phone, but not at me. I know. Really weird. But that's the thing. We haven't really got it yet. No. We haven't really evolved into it or, or know quite how to deal with it. And I, I, there are great things about it, but there are also things we don't really know. The cost the of it. The outcome of the cost. There, there of it, is actually. a real, there's definitely well, a I mean, how do you deal with it? Because I know, you're, well, you said you, you're not on social and... No. But you must have had a huge amount of exposure beyond what you've had before with the success of The Crown. Yeah, but I think I'm really fortunate in the sense that I have always... You are a very distinctive looking person. <laughs> I'm odd looking. No, you're not. No, it's not about being odd looking, but it's about if you're out of the ordinary of... Yeah, you know, normal life anyway. Me and Matt Smith, you can kind of... Yeah, you would, if you walked into a room anywhere, everyone would go, oh, hello, you're interesting. Whereas, and, I, and it's, I'm not like being humble. I'm just, that's the reality. Like I walk in a room and everyone goes, oh, no, did I work? No, is she my cousin? I don't know. Like that's, <laughs> yes. that's I'm familiar to people, but yeah. I'm not, I don't attract attention. And I'm, I'm realising that now. And I feel very lucky because I can go about my life yeah. pretty much unscathed. That's amazing. Um, and I think that I do think that is to do with a certain amount of volume of attention, though. And I think that will just I, because of how brilliant you are. Please don't tell but, me it'll change because I'm really enjoying it at the moment. <laughs> because keep it's enjoying really it, keep enjoying. Because it. it only happens when you actually interact with people on an actual, like quite often the most the most of the time that it happens is that I'm on an airplane and the stewardesses or the, the air stewards, after a while of me sort of harassing them for cups of tea and stuff, then go. It's only after I've actually really, really yeah, spent time yeah, with people yeah. that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But I don't, I find, you know, it's a personal choice for me. It's not about being um, an actor or anything like that, but I'm right. not on social media. It's because I feel the effect it has on me as a person. Yeah, yeah. I was on Facebook for about a year and a half when I was about 22. And it physically, I could, I could feel what it did to me. It made me anxious. It made me, you know, compare myself to other people. It made me stalk people. <laughs> um, and I it made me feel, it put a barrier up between me and other people. Yeah. And I just can't, I can't live in that no. world. Um, and it's not about my job or anything. crave something that you're not getting. It's yeah. like, um, yeah. It's and a, it's, it's so, it, that's the thing is, I know how it, every, I'd be so addicted to it. Mm. I couldn't even dip my toe in it because I, I think it's so addictive. It just, that's it. It draws you down. Me too. And I mean, I, I fight, I fight for no phone time myself. You know, just getting yeah. emails or texts, and that's that's as social as I get. And I, I, that's a, that's a struggle for me. Can I pick him up later? I would really like to get away from New York, if at all possible. Your father's ashes will be available tomorrow afternoon. I see. No chance of a rush job. Hmm. I'll leave you alone with him. Cafe, I wondered if um, working on the uh, <laughs> crown has changed your attitude towards the royals, or what your attitude was before. Or I don't really wonder this. I've been, I've got to, I'm not, I have been asked to ask this question. I, it's the last thing I'm interested. <laughs> I'd in rather know what, you, whether it changed your opinion of the royal family. Yes, watching it, it. Yes, it did. Yeah, it did. It really did. And I mean. <sighs> Or did it? Because you know behind closed doors, families are families, no matter what mm. strains and stresses and pressures and oddities that family endures. There's a grandmother, there's an uncle, there's an aunt, there's a mother, there's a brother, there's a sister. There's, mm. And it, I, I think I knew very little about the, the relationship between Margaret and Elizabeth, and, that's, and, and about Margaret and herself, and that's just, it's such a perfectly toxic storm, mm. that story. And you kind of come away with so much more sympathy for her because of how what we gossip wise here has been created was created well it's interesting how history forms itself to focus on the on the story they want to tell yeah and, and i think part of what we do you we, we you i know you've experienced that mm. and, uh, and I, I certainly have in the media where it's like we want to make this really negative because that runs with that name and that's that's our mm. that's our copy sold you know yeah and like, you, you see that then with the royals mm, you do and i think it's uh I think you you end up seeing them as human beings, which is really good. And I think, but there's a choice, isn't there? I think with any sort of like deity or like God or anything, you don't want to think of them as human beings. Yeah. Um, because it means that you have to then look at yourself. Yeah, I wonder if there's a generation that can't actually watch The Crown because they want they want that distance. They want to be sort of adoring at the feet of it rather than in the living room or the bedroom. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think people were like, how dare you talk about their marriage? Yeah. How dare you talk about the fact that I'm how dare you talk about them not having trouble in their marriage? I'm like, have you spoken to your next door neighbour yeah. recently? Or like, have you spoken to anybody that you know about their marriage? Like, do you think that everybody in the world is having a perfect it's time? presentational, yeah, chocolate just, box version. And that's what I mean about social media as well. I think that's what's happening is everyone's pretending that their lives are great all the time and we're losing any sort of track of the fact that life is beautiful because it is hard. Yeah. And I, don't, I think that, yeah, that, that really worries me. Um, and it's I have to say, as far as what they have to do, as far as presentation and projected mm. image, as mm. well as what we sometimes have to do, and how you just you crave the moment you can break that down a little bit. Although it's often then just run away with the misunderstood. But if it's in person, I find you can be yourself. You can in person be. But yourself. that's what's incredible about her, the Queen of England, is that um, she has never done that. She's never. Um, she is always, when she's at work, she is always the icon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that icon has been steadfastly the same. Yeah. You know, she, uh, the younger generation are able to become more uh, kind of, um, they're able to have more interaction and be, yes. you know, and she is, she, everybody say, has I mean, a good meeting with her. You know, but. I know this is probably the one bit that's going to end up on the internet, so I'm loath mm -hmm. to ask it because it's so fluffy, but are you excited about the royal wedding? Are you? <laughs> I are you going? Because that I, is I who has been asking going. since I've been here. I, I could have imagined myself going, but... So What's happened? Know. Where's the invitation? Has it got lost in the post? I mean, we came, you know, we moved into a new home recently, so, so I it's think it's probably just, down to that. Yeah, yeah. probably the post office. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. As is mine, I'm it, imagining. It's got lost. Someone's stolen it. Yeah. Why they wouldn't want you there, I don't know.